to welcome you all to this special um, Holocaust Living History Workshop uh, featuring Mr. Larry Greenbaum. Uh, when we started this workshop, um, the reason that it was launched in the first place was really to um, advertise to increase the vis uh, visibility of uh, the Visual History Archive. Uh, many of you know about this, but I want to mention it again for those of you who are new to our workshop. Um, what I did today is I thought, let me find out how many um, survivors or witnesses come from the town of Dudelsheim, where Mr. Greenbaum is from. So I went to the archive and I entered the search term Dudelsheim, and sure enough, I found a cousin of Mr. Greenbaum. <laughs> and the size of the archive is such that you're likely to, whenever you look for somebody, you probably find uh, the person that uh, you are looking for, or a relative, or a friend. It's, it has such, um, it is so extensive, really. So um, if you're interested to know more about the archive, which is located here on campus, uh, you can contact me. Um, I'll be happy to sit down with you and to help you uh, make the best use of this wonderful resource. Uh, now I would like to introduce uh, one of our most talented graduate students, the doctoral candidate Anna Clara Schenderlein, who has graciously agreed to interview Mr. Greenbaum. The reason why I asked Anna Clara to do this is that she is an expert um, on Jewish immigration, emigration and return, actually. She's working on a dissertation on this topic, and so she will be the perfect person to give a bit of a background on this topic. Please help me welcome Anna Clara Schenderlein and Larry Greenbaum. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Can you all hear me all right? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I will just give a very brief introduction, very general about the conditions of Jews before um, um, the Nazi rise of power and then emigration and return. It's very brief, but I welcome questions um, after we do our little interview here. Um, so in 1933, about uh, 530,000 Jews lived in Germany. Um, this is about uh, less than 1% of the total population. The great majority of Jews in Germany viewed themselves as integral of and to the German nation and culture. They viewed themselves primarily as German citizens with commitments of different degrees to the Jewish faith, cultural tradition, and the Jewish heritage. The early years of the Weimar Republic in particular were a time and place in which many Jews felt that they could, could live both as Germans and Jews. The takeover of the Nazis destroyed this atmosphere. Beginning in April of 1933, the Nazis passed legislations which step by step limited Jewish participation in virtually all areas of public life. By 1935, almost all Jews were either prohibited to work in their professions or they were extremely restricted in pursuing them. Many Jewish students left public high schools and universities even before laws were uh, excluded them officially because the anti-Jewish atmosphere made attendance unbearable. The Nuremberg race laws of September 1935 intruded further into private life, prohibiting marriages and sexual relations between Aryans and Jews. Despite all this discrimination, uh, Jewish emigration initially happened rather hesitantly. Between 1933 and 1938, 140,000 Jews left Germany, many of them heading to neighboring countries. The decision to leave Germany was in itself very difficult. Um, there were lots of factors involved that I cannot really go into here. And even once a decision was made, it was not an easy undertaking. Immigration to most countries was greatly restricted. The Evian Conference of July 1938, supposed to find a solution to the growing number of people wanting to leave Germany, failed as the 32 participating countries showed themselves <coughs> unable to reach agreements that would help the refugees. The November pogrom of 1938 did, however, cause a dramatic increase in Jewish emigration, even though it had become ever more difficult to find a place to emigrate to. In, in addition, by 1938-39, the Nazi regime had built up a whole bureaucracy of rules and restrictions to harass and humiliate the Jews who wanted to leave. They had to file various documents, appear at different offices, receive clearances, and pay increasingly higher taxes before they could emigrate. By September 1939, um, the month that the war broke out, 
approximately 282,000 Jews had left Germany and 117,000 from annexed Austria. Of these, some 95,000 emigrated to the United States, 60,000 to Palestine, 40,000 to Great Britain, and about 75,000 to Central and South America. And of course, we know Larry was one of them uh, who came to the United States, um, and we will hear a little bit more about this in a minute. Um, but since the focus of the talk today is really also the return um, of Larry as a soldier in the US Army, I just want to give a few numbers um, about refugee soldiers. It is actually very difficult to, to determine the exact number of refugees um, who were in the US Army. Um, people say, or some scholars have estimated between 9,500 uh, and 30,000. My own uh, estimate is really about 15,000. Um, there are several historians who are working on the topic of uh, refugee soldiers in the US Army at the moment, and so we expect that there will be more accurate numbers within the next year or so. Um, initially, German Jewish refugees uh, could not, not serve in the US Army on equal terms as other Americans because they were classified as enemy aliens. Um, the US government did not take into consideration um, that these people were actually refugees from the Nazis, but they were really classified as de facto Nazis, which was not a good <laughs> experience for many. Um, but the restrictions um, were lifted for refugees in the army in 1943. And then the military began to regularly recruit German emigres and particularly also Jewish refugees. Um, some of them were assigned to do intelligence work, especially also translation work, and Larry will also tell us a little bit more about this. Um, and in this capacity, many refugee soldiers ended up taking part in the conquest of their former homeland, sometimes less than 10 years uh, after they had left it. Um, and yes, we will now hear from Larry how he experienced, how he experienced that conquest. Um, but um, we will go first before we talk about return, we have to talk about the beginning. Um, um, and I will just say a few words about Larry in general. He was born on January 29, 1924, in the small town of Düdelsheim, which is northeast of Frankfurt in the German state of Hesse. Um, and Larry was born as Lothar Grünebaum. <laughs> um, his father was a cattle dealer, um, which was a very common occupation um, for German Jews in rural areas of Germany, and was often a profession that people had for, gener for several generations. Um, and his mother was a housewife. Housewife. Uh, and um, just to give you an idea about this little town of Düdelsheim, um, in 1924, um, Düdelsheim had about, oh no, not about, it had 74 Jewish citizens, 5.2% of the population um, of 1,435, yeah? And a Jewish community had existed in this town for a long time, um, we think since the 16th or 17th century. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so Larry, we, I think we will start by, um, I will ask you first a to tell us a little bit about this life in, in the little town of Dudelsheim and a little bit about how it was before the Nazis came to power and then also yeah. how it changed. Well, it, it was a, a very good time, uh, mostly for Jews in this little town before the Nazis came. Everyone got along. Of course, there were uh, some anti-Semites even then, like they are all over the world. But generally, Jews were accepted. They were part of the community. Uh, there was not too much uh, social uh, inter interaction. Uh, interaction with uh, the Christian families but uh, uh, everyone got along. For instance, we had two uh, public bake ovens where people would uh, knead their dough at home and then they would bring it to these public bake ovens. And each family in town had a certain day where they could bake, like every two weeks or something like that. And, but generally, everyone was accepted. And, uh, yeah, how, how did that change? Well, then when in 1932, of course, there was a, a general election, and Hitler uh, was, free, was a freely elected 
Chancellor of Germany. But of course, the Jews knew what would happen if he were, you know, if he was elected. And uh, it was a, at that time uh, very bad for the Jews, because you could immediately tell uh, that there was a separation. Christians would no longer talk to Jews unless it was on the sly, because they themselves were a little bit afraid because they were afraid of their own government and uh, to the extent that my our neighbor a uh, uh, name by the name of Koch who later became the mayor of that town after the war he was a very good friend to my father we had adjoining property and he met my father once on the street and he whispered to him meet me at the fence. So they met at the fence at night and he said, I can no longer talk to you anymore. When I see you make believe I said hello to you and you said hello to me because they threatened to burn my house down if they hear me talk to you. So that, that was about it. And then of course, we Jewish children went to the same school but of course, we were not, uh, they wouldn't talk to us. And then slowly but surely, uh, we got beaten up. It was an almost daily occurrence. At first, you would defend yourself. Then after a while, there was no use defending yourself. You just lie down and you covered your head and you, uh, you, you, took a, you took a good beating. To the extent that one time, I even forgot to tell you that, at the school there was a, a, a coal cellar and they had a chute going down where they came with sacks of coal and uh, I was beaten so severely in order for me to get away, I went down that coal chute into the coal, into the coal cellar, and I stayed there all day till the custodian of the school heard me screaming and he finally let me out of that thing and where I could walk home. And uh, that was the extent of everything that went on and it got worse day to day, it got a little worse uh, till finally, you know, my father could do nothing. We were little more than just flotsam and, and that was it. You couldn't go to court. You had no rights. You could not go to court uh, to complain. And they could, basically they could do with you what they wanted. Yeah. And uh, there, there was a time uh, later on uh, when two Gestapo agents came to our house, unannounced, of course, a young man and an older Gestapo agent. And they started searching for the house. Basically, they really wanted to annoy you and uh, demean you. And they were looking for gold and for silver. Everybody was told the Jews had bought the money. Of course, that was nonsense. And they started in the basement looking for this and for that. They finally worked themselves up to the first floor and the second floor. And they opened up a closet. And there was my uncle's uniform from the first war was an officer. And the young officers said, what is this doing in this closet? So my grandmother said, that's my son's uniform. He was an officer in the First World War. And uh, the older man, who must have been a World War I veteran also, he said to the younger one, come on, let's get out of this house. I've seen enough. And they left never to return. No one ever came back to return. And I wanted to bring my mother, my, my father was a four year veteran in the German army, first served on the Russian front, 
when the Russians were defeated in 1917, he was transferred to France, and he was in the trenches in, in France for four years, including the Battle of Verdun, which was a carnage. <laughs> Unbelievable. He never got a scratch. He won the Iron Cross, and he won a medal. And this is ironic from Hitler. At a, Anna saw the, saw the medal uh, for heroism in action. In, so, in February 1935, he received that. Yeah, he received that in 35. So that's, that was the story of my life. Yeah. Um, so, so did you, your parents decided then to send you to a different school? Uh, oh, yeah. Then I went to, uh, I couldn't go to school there anymore. It was impossible. They didn't, they told us not to come to school anymore. So we went to a Jewish school, uh, like a high school. And in Frankfurt, Frankfurt of mine. And that's where we were. And uh, I was there till we left for the United States in 1938. Yeah, can you tell us a little bit, I don't know if you know enough about how your parents made the decision to leave Germany? Yeah, well, my father was the eternal optimist. He always thought it, it's gonna get better. Uh, and my uncle, who was a doctor, he left for Palestine in 1934. He was a religious Zionist. And he told my father, leave, because this is not going to end well for the Jews. And he was, he was a prophet in his own time. And my father said, ah, don't worry about it. It'll, it'll be better. But finally, it got worse and worse and worse. And we finally, my father had a friend here in the United States who gave us a visa. So we had to go to Stuttgart, uh, where the American consulate was. But of course, you had to be careful what you said to the consul. If you told the consul that you had a job in America, he refused your entry to the United States. We'd never get a green card. The reason that being, there was a huge unemployment in the United States. There were 16 million people unemployed. And if you already had a job before you got to the United States, it, the government just, it, that was unthinkable. And so uh, many Jews made the mistake of saying that they had a job already because they had relatives here that came before. And, and so on. So finally, that was settled. Uh, we left in uh, May 1938, for the, we arrived in May 1938 in the United States. At that time, my father, uh, each family was allowed 10 marks to leave the country. They confiscated everything, but they also let us, they allowed us to take out furniture that, you know, that we had, that we owned, and dishes and whatever. And so we had like a lift, you know, like, like a, a railroad car full of uh, household belongings. And that's how we came. My father had $40 or 40 marks in his pocket when he came lived with relatives we got here that came before. We stayed with them for a week. They rented an apartment, six-room apartment. They rented out three rooms, two people. My father went to work. My mother, who was a housefrau in Germany, leisurely and things, she hired herself out as a maid, cleaning houses. My grandmother took in sewing uh, people didn't throw socks away. People didn't throw shirts away. If the collar was frayed, my grandmother got the shirt. She turned the collars. And I don't know, 25 cents a shirt, 35 cents, whatever. And we, we rented out a room for like $20 a week or something like that. And we made it. And... Uh, 
no Jew ever went, went on welfare in the United States. First of all, they couldn't. You even worked, right? As a student? Oh, yeah. Sure. I worked before I went to school. I worked for a grocery there, in a grocery store, delivering groceries to people. And we used to get... Uh, we, we didn't have refrigeration in those days, even in the stores. We had ice boxes. So they used to come, a milk delivery truck was to come with like 40, 50 cases, each six bottles to a case. I would empty those out into the ice boxes. Then an ice truck came with 50 pound blocks of ice. I would chop that up and throw the ice all over, all over the milk. And then I was off to school. So it was tough, but it was good. We made it. Um, how, did your parents miss Germany at that time? So I, think, I think my mother more, at least she verbalized it more. She always used to say, es war doch so schön in Deutschland. You know, it was so beautiful in Germany. But, uh, you know, that's how people felt. And people felt, why should we have, left? Why should we have had to leave? We were Germans. Yeah, and you, when you moved to New York, you moved to Washington Heights. Washington which, Heights, which yes. Which was an area that some people then called the Fourth Reich because there were so many German-Jewish refugees. Yeah, they always called us Yekes. Yekes is a, uh, when the Jews moved to Israel, they, German Jews always were dressed in tie jackets. And a Yekes in Yiddish is jacket. And... The Israelis all were no no jackets or anything. That if somebody wore a jacket, they knew they were a German Jew. And they called them jackets. So um, your parents mostly socialized then with people in Washington Heights. Yeah, refugees. only with yeah, of course. You know, we had friends uh, that uh, came from the same town in Germany, and. Uh, and the, the German Jews they were like clickish. They stuck to themselves. And there were, oh, I don't know, it was, was German town. Um, but you did not really, you did not keep continuous, you know, speaking German. Oh, I was Americanized three days after I came to the United <laughs> States. I, I, re I really was. I, when I came here, I did not speak one word of English. In three months, I was fluent. You, you swim or you sink. And if you, if you really wanted to accomplish something in a new country, you had to speak the language. That was number one. Education was the number one thing. Anything else? Well, now I think, so you went to high school, um, you make friends with all kinds of American boys. Yeah, American boys. Sure. baseball. Yeah, we played baseball, stickball, got in trouble with the police <laughs> because we broke a few windows here and there. And the, the police cars would, have one police car, one end of the block, and another police car at the other end, and they would, they would grab us. And then if I told my dad, I got caught by the police, well, don't ask. <laughs> okay, and so in 1941, when the war broke out, yeah. um, you were 17. Yeah. Um, how did you feel about this? Were you interested in then taking part uh, in the oh, fight yeah. against it, the Nazis? Yeah, of course. At 18, I was inducted in the army. Uh, I was sent to Camp Grand, Illinois, as a medical, uh, basically a bedpan commando. <laughs> you know what that is. And uh, we got our basic training there. After 13 weeks of basic training, we, uh, we went to Fort Knox, Kentucky, where I was assigned to the 140th General Hospital because the invasion of Europe was to begin shortly before that, and they needed a lot of medical training because they knew the casualties would be horrendous, which 
they were. So we went to England, and we were there for a while. Then, of course, there was time lapses. Uh, they assigned me to a uh, frontline front line medic, means I was among I would be amongst the infantry as a, as a medic to tend to wounded and so on and so forth. So I went to France, Belgium, and finally I went across. I never caught up with my unit that I was assigned to. They moved so fast. I think that was Patton's doing. He moved so fast. He, he, they, nobody could keep up with him. And. Uh, So finally, by that time, I, w we, I went across the, at the Rhine River uh, near Cologne. And Do you know what, what this was then in, in early 1945? 45, yeah. The war was like almost over. Mm -hmm. And finally, the war was over. And a lot of GIs were sent to a camp where they said, well, we have to assemble you here. We'll ship you back to the United States for three or four weeks furlough. And from then, we get ship you back to the, into the Pacific to fight Japan. And, uh, but that turned out not to be necessary because President Truman dropped a bomb on them, or two. And that was the end of that. And then they assigned me as a uh, an interpreter with the military government in Germany, where I finally and coincidentally I was stationed in the town in Düsseldorf, where I was born. This was total coincidence. I mean, I was sitting in the back of a truck, and I, all of a sudden, I said, "My God, this this area looked familiar to me." And then, you know, I was 14 when I came here, and I was 19 or 20, yeah, 20 when I was back. Six, what, six, seven years, eight years. And that was that. So I was stationed in Dudelsheim for six months till I was discharged. Yeah, and this was very unusual. Usually, the army made uh, sure that people who were from Germany originally would not get uh, posted yeah. in the towns. Yeah. So sometimes it happened, uh, and sometimes when they were coincidentally in those places and they needed someone who speaks German, they you know they would use these refugees as interpreters, for example. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about how it felt to then enter your hometown after these six years? Yeah, uh, well. Uh, I stopped, I asked the truck to stop, and I said, I'm going to walk through this town, Main Street, and I wanted to see if anybody would recognize me. So I walked through Main Street, which wasn't all that large, maybe a half a mile, even less, and I walked past Mr. Koch, the one that I mentioned before. I, I passed his house, I passed my parents' house, and I went to the other neighbor's house. And I walked into their yard, and there was a girl who was doing something. She was the owner of the house, and she heard somebody coming. So she turns around, she did a double take. She looked at me and she went, oh my God. Lothar, what are you doing here? She was surprised. This is a girl that I went to school with. And of course then, uh, you know, talk went through the town very quickly. And I was surrounded by a lot of people, and of course, you couldn't find a Nazi. Nobody was a Nazi. They were all very good people. Of course, there were some that were good. These two neighbors that I talk about, they were especially good. When Hitler first came to power, Mr. Koch told us, look, 
they are probably going to beat up all the Jews. You live in my house overnight. And he had us come live in their house. Because we, my father was very good friends. And, but then, of course, you know, it got worse for him also, and he just couldn't. After a while, it could, they could do nothing. And, uh, yeah, that's... Yeah, well, how did you feel about all these people who said, oh, we, did, we didn't do anything, or we didn't know what was going yeah, on? Yeah, well, uh, uh, what, what, what could you say? I said, are you, are you sure, you know? I mean, nobody was a Nazi. I saw the flags coming, stones being thrown through our house every night, breaking windows. So finally my parents got, uh, sh you know, wooden shades f for the house. But the bombings with rocks against that was just as bad as breaking the windows. And that's how we lived till we left to 38. And... Yeah. What was your um, duty um, while you were stationed in Dudelsheim? I was an interpreter for the military government. Our, my commanding officer was a major. He was a, an attorney in civilian life, and he acted as judge and jury. And if there were usually disputes between German against German, you know, property or theft, whatever, he had to adjudicate that. You know, they would sue and they would come to us. Of course, he didn't speak in, uh, German, which I did. And I could interpret back and forth what, what went on. Not really easy for me because technical things uh, I couldn't understand. And I was too young when I left that, you know, when you're a kid, the language is different than when you're, than when you're an adult. But basically, I, I, I had a good time. I had a good friend of mine. He was an Italian, also uh, in our regiment. And his name was Angelo Palazzo. He was my best friend. And uh, so we, we had a good time there for six months. Also, uh, you know, right after the war, uh, even though the peace was declared, some Germans, what they would do with our jeeps, we usually had jeeps, they would string piano wire on roads, piano wire from one side of the street to the other, tight. You couldn't see the wire. And if a jeep went by without anything, you were decapitated. So finally what our engineers did, they uh, welded steel, a steel tubing with a hook above our heads so that if anything would happen, they would cut the wire, split the wire in half. But uh, then, you know, that lessened also. And uh, Oh, did, yes. did you ever get into, so did you have much interaction with the, with the people in your town while you were uh, there? Not, not too much. Mm -hmm. I tried to stay away. Mm -hmm. I, I really didn't want anything to do with them uh, because it, it, didn't, it didn't seem right to become friends with them. Who, who wanted to be friends with them, basically? And uh, so, I, of course, I couldn't do anything about Let's say I could have taken revenge on some of them. That would not have been right either. The war was over, and no matter how much anger I had, I was under military rule. I could not dishonor myself nor the flag. So that's, I don't think, I don't think and Jewish people were not out for revenge. Can you attest to that? Yes. Yeah. No revenge. No revenge. I didn't. Yeah. No revenge. Yeah, they're not really uh, any cases. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, 
Well, I was curious, how much did you know about the Holocaust when you were in the army? I did not know anything about the Holocaust. Didn't hear anything. When, when was the first time that you became conscious of the... When I saw yeah. some people, uh, when I saw some people, a family came back and they settled in Brüdinger. Mm. But I, I didn't know who they were. I had no, I had absolutely no idea. And later on, I found, I found it was a Jewish family, but I, I have no idea where they came from or why they settled why they settled there in, 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 in Brüdingen. And they were from Eastern Europe? Or? I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I had no contact with them either. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I'm sorry to say. Mm -hmm. uh, I, was a, I was a dumb kid. No. <laughs> okay, so you stayed in Germany for, for six months? Uh, six months, yeah. And I was finally uh, sent home. I had enough points to go back home. And uh, in 1946, January 46, I was sent home. How did you feel about that? Great. Great. I was home to see the statue in New York Harbor. As a matter of fact, I remember when I left New York, I lived in New York, and I was like 30, 40 blocks from my house in New York, and I went to my commanding officer and said, please, let me go home. I lived right here. And he said, Are you sure you're going to come back? <laughs> and he wouldn't let me go. It was, it, it was secret where we were going. And I finally we went overseas. It, took, it was a two-week two trip in a convoy that had maybe 200, 200 ships in that convoy. We went zigzag back and forth, destroyers all going around. And uh, of course, the troop ships were in the center, and then ammunition, artillery, and, and, and supplies were around that. And finally, the warships were all around. And we finally landed in, uh, uh, well, senior moment, forgive me. Uh, we, what's the port in uh, England? No, not Bournemouth. I, got, I was stationed in Bournemouth. Yeah. Great duty in France. The Queen and King of England used a vacation there. And, uh, oh, I don't know, I, it makes no difference. Anyway, we got there. Yeah, so um, when you left Germany, did you have any interest what would become of that country? I didn't care. Um, Absolutely didn't care. Uh, you know, I went through m most of southern Germany. I was in Fr uh, Frankfurt. I was in Cologne. Everything was bound out. I was happy. And literally, I was happy. Uh, it, and I thought it would take Germany a hundred years to rebuild. But they did it in, like, once things got going, with American help, financial help, the Marshall Plan, in 10 years, everything was rebuilt. And so... How much did Germany and your past matter in your life after you returned to the United States? It didn't matter. It didn't matter. I went back uh, on a visit. And, uh, of course, we... We stayed in Germany for a while. My uh, wife had a cousin that lived in Dortmund. Uh, she was half Jewish. Her husband happened to be a Nazi officer. And uh, she had a, a daughter and a son. And uh, but she she stayed she stayed in she stayed in Germany. Her daughter is uh, still lives in Dortmund, and uh, her husband is a a veterinarian. And but other than that, I went back. We went to 
Nuremberg, where my friend was born, Birchfass. And from there, we went to uh, Nur uh, Vienna, where Mary was born. And we, then we went to Budapest. And this was sometime in the 80s? Yeah, that was in the 80s, yeah. And so your wife was from Vienna, did from you? From Vienna. Vienna. Yeah. Did you speak German at home? No. Only I spoke, well, I'm sorry. Uh, I spoke only German to my parents and to my grandmother. Other than that, I had no reason to speak mm -hmm. German. So, yeah, because all my friends spoke English. And uh, that was it. Um, you told me that your father, um, after the war, sent uh, food packages yes, this, to, to my, his friend. Yeah, my father then wrote to this Mr. Koch, who later became the mayor of this town. Uh, he, he wrote to him. He wrote back. And then my father periodically sent him food packages, stuff that they, that they could not get because he basically, he was a decent guy. And if he hadn't, if he had not stopped talking to my father, they would have burned his house down. It was always a lesson for somebody else. You open your mouth, we'll get you. And after a while, there was a, a pastor, like Pastor Niemöller mm -hmm. in Germany. He used to say, first, they came for the communists, and we said nothing. Then they came for the Jews, and we said nothing. Finally, they came for us, and there was nobody to speak for us. So let's not give up our freedoms here so fast. That's all I can say. Just one more question about how representative maybe that story of your father sending packages to people who were decent in Germany was. Do you know other people from no, the I, No, I don't. I really don't. Okay. Um, well, um, I have... Thing, I think I've worked through all the questions I have, so maybe we can Maybe open someone can uh, you know, open up for yeah. questioning. Yes, sir? Uh, so you were part of the 3rd Army? In, in the no, I was part of the 7th Army. 7th Army. Yeah, General Hodges. Hodges. Yeah. Yes, sir? When your family left to come to America, yes. what happened to the home? They lost? The home was all... Uh, my, well, my father sold it. But way, way, way undervalued. Uh -huh. Yeah. Afterwards, afterwards, he got money back mm -hmm. because uh, that was, I think, a deal the United States made with uh, uh, Chancellor Adenauer. Remember Adenauer? He was. Anybody remember Adenauer? Was he was the he was the first chancellor after after yeah. When you came back to Doodle's time, tell them where you were stationed in Doodle's time. Yeah, in the house where I where where I where I lived. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, that's that's where they had their headquarters. Yes. Yeah. When you left Germany, was it hard to get out of Germany at that time? And my second question is, do you feel the German people at that time? were just as much to blame as the Nazis? Uh, I would say that, uh, you know, I can't read the German mind, but uh, uh, the way they adored Hitler, I would say most of the Germans were with Hitler. Uh, for, for whatever reason, I, I, I don't know. Uh, it's... Uh, and what was the... No, at that time it was okay. You, they would, they were glad you left. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They left us out. I, as I said before, with our furniture and everything. Yeah. Yeah. When you left, did you come by boat? Yeah, I came on an American boat. Are you, are you? I was Ameri We were American before we got here, on the USS Washington. <laughs> It, it, actually, it was a, uh, a uh, 
passenger liner. It was not exclusively for the refugees. Yeah. This was a, just a normal passenger ship. Yeah. yeah. But they, you know, they, uh, yeah. Yes. Um, looking back on your life, how would you say has this experience affected uh, or made you the person you are? That you were forced to leave your home country at the young age and, okay. and you had to go back? Well, I would say I was young. I adjusted better than older people like my parents. And, you know, it's tough to be thrown out of a country that you had attachments to. Like Jews are attached to the United States. We love this country. And all of a sudden somebody comes and says, you're not wanted here anymore, unthinkable. So that's how I feel. Could you talk a little bit about how in your experience this affected your parents? Because as you say, it was harder for your parents. Yeah, well, it was, hard for, it was hard for my parents. My father worked, you know, he did menial labor because he didn't speak the language. He came here, he was 52 years old. He didn't know, he didn't have a profession. Uh, usually, uh, uh, Jews that came here, let's say they had a profession like attorneys, uh, even though they couldn't practice law here, they became accountants. And uh, so, or if you were a scientist, it was easy for them to get a job here. Einstein got here, and uh, he got a job. <laughs> And your mother, she never worked before, so. Yeah, my mother was a housefrau, and she uh, she was a maid. She cleaned uh, houses, four, four or five houses, five days a week. Not, not very. I wouldn't say it's demeaning. Any any work that you do honestly is not demeaning, but she was not used to that kind of life. So it was for the elderly. It was tough. No question. Yes. When and where did you meet your wife? I met my wife in New Jersey at a lake. We, we it was summertime and we kids, we you know, and I saw a nice, beautiful lady with a little poodle walking along, <laughs> and I said, "She's for me." <laughs> and that's how it was. And we got married in 1949. We were married 63 years. How many children? <laughs> well, three, three grandchildren. Two boys and one beautiful girl. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Deborah. Oh, well, thank you very much for this very moving talk. Oh, your sense of humor and your irony were not lost on us. And I want to congratulate my student on just finishing the last chapter of her dissertation. I but I do have two questions. Um, the first one is about Palestine, the road not taken. What would your life have been like if your family had gone to Palestine? And the second one, could you tell us a little bit more about the Jewish and the German and the English meanings of your original name, Lothar? Okay, so the first question was, what would your life have been like if you had emigrated to Palestine? I don't know. What do you think? So how did it go for your, un your uncle went to My Palestine? uncle, he had a tough time. Uh, he went to Palestine. He didn't speak Hebrew. He didn't speak Hebrew. He was a physician. And uh, it was tough for him, but it, it, he managed. Yeah. Did he go with his family? Or he went, went with his family, yeah. His wife, two daughters, my cousins, whom I visited in Israel. Uh, some years ago, and uh, so on. But I, what I probably would afford, who knows, I might have been killed. And the second question was about the meaning of your first name, Lothar, if you know more. I, I think Lothar was a, a name in German mythology, is that right? Some people huh? in the audience think so. You, I'm not sure. What kind of a German uh, are you? I, I think you're right, but I don't know the meaning. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, I don't know either. So it was not. So I guess Deborah is the question whether lots Why of. Oh. Why didn't I say Lothar? I needed an English name. So it was L. Lawrence. And now everybody calls me Larry. Ah. And when did you change your name? When I first signed my first uh, income tax form. Ooh, but, but this was, uh, you were naturalized when you were in the army, right? Yeah. I was considered, I was in the army, I was considered an enemy alien, of course. They thought I was a spy for Germany. And uh, uh, so finally, they could not send me overseas unless I was a citizen. So we took a bunch of Jewish guys, they sent us to Louisville, Kentucky, and there were maybe 40, 50 Jewish kids that were all from Germany, and a federal judge swore us in, and we were officially non-spies. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people changed their names uh, when they were when they got naturalized because it was obviously easier also to be in the army with an American-sounding name. Yeah. So. so I've been Lawrence or Larry ever since. <laughs> yes. Um, after you. Uh, I, be, I became a, I, actually I did that before I went into the service, I became a camera technician. Camera. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, my boss, who was also a German Jew, he, uh, he, uh, he learned his trade at Lights in Wetzlar. And he trained me. Uh, he, as a matter of fact, he came over on the same boat. Yeah. You, you, mentioned, you mentioned some things that you couldn't say. You could not say you had a job here before you got here. So what could you say? What, what you could you say, say if they asked you, did you have a job here? You said you didn't have a job. But you could say that you had someone who will um, pay for you, your life. The sponsor that gave us a visa, he was responsible mm -hmm. for us. If we, you know, there was no such thing as coming here and going on welfare right away. That was, it, it, it's just not right. I, I, and I think even if he could have, my father would have sooner died than go on welfare. He would have done anything not to go on welfare. There was, he, that was a thought that never even entered his mind. Yeah, so in order to come here, you had to have an affidavit, basically a sponsor from an American yeah. citizen. Yeah. And he was he was responsible, and if he uh, if he was wealthy enough to bring in let's say twenty or thirty Jewish families, he had a big obligation, because if they all went couldn't support themselves, he would have had to support all of them. But really, I from what I know is that most. Uh, people, most refugees had the same attitude as your father. They really wanted to start out and uh, work and do whatever they can to be to stand on their own feet. Everything. I don't think there was. I don't think there would anybody that would have gone on welfare. It's just they just <laughs> just didn't. They just didn't think of it. Uh, I wanted to say something, and I have another senior moment. Oh, probably because I interrupted you. <laughs> Uh, I forgot. Yes, ma'am. What brought you to California? Beg your pardon? What brought you to California? What moved me to California? My mother in law. Clarify that. She lived here. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, my mother in law. My mother in law got remarried. She married a gentleman uh, from San Diego and we came to visit. That, I would say, was about 50 years ago. Yeah, about 50 years ago. And when I came here and saw this part of the United States, 
I said to my wife, I am not staying another day in New York. <laughs> Go west, young man. <laughs> and uh, so she said, I'm willing, but I have my, my sister and brother-in-law. We all live, my mother-in-law, my sister and brother-in-law, Mary and I, we lived in the same building. It was an apartment building in, New York, in, the, in the Bronx. And we got along great, and my wife would never have moved without her sister. So we induced them to move, <laughs> and we all moved. <laughs> and I never regretted the day to be out of New York. <laughs> Even though I loved New York. When I, went, when I first came here, I used to get a nickel from my father, and I would go to the subway, and go from one, it looked, stand in front next to the motorman, and would go from one part of the city on one nickel, back and forth all day long. I mean, I used to go downtown to the Empire State Building when I first came in, and just stood there. God, you're great. <laughs> No, I have no, uh, no, I have no bad feelings about present Germany. It's it's a different generation. Uh, I don't like the old generation that I grew up with, but Germans today doesn't bother. Does not bother me. You cannot, you cannot hold the children today responsible for their parents or their grandparents' death. Yes? Would your belief system change knowing what you saw what Germany did in World War II? Do you still believe in God? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, definitely. You know, I, I wouldn't, you know, sometimes, you know, I was brought up re religious in a religious family, kept Shabbat, and all that, but uh, in the army I sort of got away a little bit, but as you get older, you know, and it comes back a little more. Now I go to synagogue every day, and uh, gotta believe, you know, there was one thing, I have a friend who was an atheist, and he told me one day, you know, I am so happy to live in the United States where I don't have to believe in God, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Did you, um, I guess, um, two questions about discrimination. Did you feel discriminated against in any way as a member, as a Jew in the U.S. Army? Yeah, I felt so. Oh, sure. Yeah, no, no doubt. But it was not overt. What about your parents back in New York as Germans? Did they feel any discrimination? No, them? because they had no contact with anybody, German Jews. Because they were all Spaniards. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we knew, uh, of course, when we came here, there was a German Nazi party in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, what was his name? Uh, Kuhn. Kuhn, mm -hmm. yeah. Kuhn, uh, in Yorkville, New York was, you know, a section of New York. A lot of Germans lived there. Mm -hmm. And, of course, he, he railed against the Jews. Another big anti-Semitic uh, person in the United States was Henry Ford. And to make him do somersaults, uh, my friend's son, is now the treasurer of the Ford Motor Company. <laughs> and, and I think Mr. Ford, the old Mr. Ford, is doing somersaults. Mm. <laughs> One question, what, what is your reaction to Jewish people buying Jewish, uh, German products? Like, uh, if you've met a Jewish person, you would it, Yeah, it well, uh, yeah. It, 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 there were Jews that we, uh, oh. we thought of this unthinkable to buy German products. I know, so what's your reaction? Yeah. 
But then again, uh, Israel got a lot of all the all the cars almost in in uh, Israel are Mercedes Benzes. Yeah, yeah. Je yeah. It was part of Vida Gutmachung. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, those, yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Yes, ma'am. Yes, in, in leaving, uh, were there people, Jewish people, that didn't want to go, that stayed behind? And what was, how was that like? Maybe there was, everybody... Those Jews that stayed were murdered. Yeah. Like, in my, from my town, uh, I don't even remember all their names anymore. They were murdered. There were two, at least 10 or 12 that I can remember that never got out and they had nowhere to go and they were, they were killed because they never showed up anywhere. So they were gone. You had family too that did not leave? Yeah, my aunt, my mother's sister, her husband was already in the United States. Uh, because he left before she did. She had two little children. One was like a baby and the other one was maybe four years old and she couldn't get out anymore and she was gone and he finally committed suicide. Anyone else? Did you find out, like, later on that you had family that died in, like, the Holocaust, or was there any time? I don't hear. Did, did you, you find out later on, or when did you find out that you had family that was, that died in the Holocaust? Yeah, my, my aunt, sure, we knew that. Because, what? you know, evidently she couldn't get here. Her husband was here. <coughs> <coughs> yeah. So did you find out um, after the war? Did you ever get confirmation where she was? No, where the family no, was never heard or anything mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, I probably could find out through the archives in Israel. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they probably have something. Mm -hmm. There's an, another question. Was the last time that you were in your hometown when you were in the U.S. Army? No, no, I was there on vacation, and we went through there, and I saw my friend Hertha Hochstein again. The one who he... The one that I went to school with. Yeah. Uh, I still have uh, an announcement to make, so please bear with me, but um, before that I would like to thank uh, Larry uh, for his uh, very insightful um, information and account uh, that was very interesting, very enlightening. Thank you, Anna Clara, also uh, for uh, doing the interview. Thank you. Thank you. And Larry. thank you. <laughs> and I really would like to thank uh, Sarah Gelbart, um, Larry's granddaughter, because she was the one uh, who introduced Larry to UCSD first. Um, he came to speak in her class a year ago or so, and uh, that's when I met Larry, and because of that, he's now here. So I'm very grateful, Sarah. Thank you. When can I come again? We'll talk about that. Um, I would like to um, just briefly introduce you to uh, two people here, uh, two filmmakers who are currently um, working on a documentary on uh, one of San Diego's most uh, well-known or best-known Holocaust survivors, Mr. Lou Dunst. Uh, they would like to talk a little bit about the project um, which they're doing. So this is Alberto Lau and this is Bob Schneider, and they'll tell you uh, what they're doing with this project. Thank you. Uh, well, some time ago, about a year ago, we had the sort of fortune surprised to meet Lou Dunst and his lovely wife, Estelle, and um, become familiar with a quite extraordinary story. And um, it, it was interesting in itself, but uh, as time has gone on, it has led us to, well, led us here. And it's led us to um, 
a, a number of interesting, informative um, aspects that hopefully will result in a, um, a documentary that, uh, that at least attempts to convey what Mr. Dunst has gone through. But, you know, I, I, uh, I say coincidences because I was in the 7th Army, I was in the 352nd General Hospital. And we, <laughs> we, we, um, this is about 20 years ago, I mean, about 20 years later. But because of this experience, we find ourselves, um, it's almost an endless string of um, uh, pieces of information and people. And it's been a very, very rewarding experience. Uh, there was a, a book that was recently published uh, on Mr. Dunn's life, and we, it, it is a very, very uh, well-written and informative book. We hope to present something a little different. What, what we need for our documentary are uh, historical photos or film from that time. And in the piece of paper that I just passed out, uh, we list specific places that we're looking uh, for historical uh, pictures or film. Uh, places where Mr. Dunst was born, the astronaut of Slovakia, now Ukraine, um, the ghetto where he was taken in uh, the former Galicia, uh, the concentration camps, uh, Auschwitz, uh, Mauthausen, and Evansley, uh, and pictures of uh, the trains know where we can look, and, it, and, and we already perform internet searches, believe us. So we, we know what's out there, but uh, we find that one of the problems with the internet is that the images are sometimes uh, low resolution, and also the provenance is questionable, so we don't know who to get permission to use those images. We want to make sure that whatever we use is legitimate, and we have the if it's a copyrighted material that we have permission to use it. So uh, we plan to go to the Holocaust Museum in LA and Washington DC, as well as do research here at UCSD. But if you have any other places you can point us to where we can find these images, we would be very grateful and our uh, contact information is on that piece of paper. And you can also contact me if you lose the flyer, uh, you can contact the Holocaust Living History Workshop. And of course, uh, I hope that in, some, in the near future, uh, we will be able to show this documentary here at one of our workshops and have uh, Lou as a guest of honor. Uh, so the more stuff you can bring in, uh, the sooner it will be done. And uh, we would love to, uh, to do this. And, and believe me, this workshop will probably be one of the first places that this film will be shown. Probably see it before it's released. You'll be informed. I'll send out. I'll bug you with emails. Uh, I would like to thank everybody. <laughs> thank you. To uh, I would like to thank everybody for taking the time to come here. Um, please feel free to approach uh, Larry personally if you want to say a few words. Uh, I also have flyers for our next event, which is on March 12th, and I think it's uh, uniquely relevant to what we've heard, um, as you've seen. The title of the event is um, Survival and Death, What Made You Know the Nazis Would Kill You? And this is going to be a talk with a political scientist, Peter Gurevich, and he has researched the experience. Oh, there he is. Oh, there's <laughs> Professor Gurevich. Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, he's going to talk about uh, some of the factors that made some uh, Jews realize the danger and get out in time, like his grandmother, and others like his uncle who did not uh, see the danger and as a result were murdered. So please um, take a flyer and uh, I wish you a good night and as I said, please stay on for a bit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.